like, oh, why is there a girl here? And before I could even open my mouth, the boys were like, but she's better than you. And they had like a massive poster of me. Like, <laughs> like a massive, literally, thing of me with a ball on my head like that. After the game, they all sort of came onto the pitch. And they're like, yeah, Captain, can you, you know, can you sign my shirt? Can I get a picture of Captain? So, like, me? I used to write this guy and like, shut up, like, and, and now I'm sharing a stage with him. Cool. Today on the podcast, we are back at TYX Studios in Tile Yard, and I am joined by the incredible Ikra Ismail. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Um, I came across your story in Forbes 30 Under 30. I mean, let's just start there. <laughs> what was that like when you got that? How did you find out about that? I sent you an email. No. Really, really, like, random out of the blue email saying, like, you've been... I think they sent, like, an initial one to say you've been nominated. Yeah. And then it's like... I had to check if it was spam I'll be real <laughs> I had to make sure okay. um, and then like I think they ask you for like a couple extra details about your life so some I think somebody else nominates you and then it goes through to like the committee that vet it and stuff so they yeah. ask you for a few more details and then after that I can't lie I didn't think I'd get past that stage and they came back and said yeah like done you're on it here you go like here's all the confirmation yeah. stuff and then they put you in um in a slack chat <laughs> no. yeah. what so, with other people from there's 10,000 of us in it Wow. Yeah, like a general Slack chat, which is crazy. So the people that what have been nominated previously. Yeah. So I think it's all, all the previous. So you've got one oh. specifically for 2023 and then you've got like one with all the previous winners. What a network. Yeah. I've checked Rihanna and then Rihanna's not in it. <laughs> I went, I was like, Rihanna, Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't downloaded yeah. Slack. Yeah, yeah right. probably not. That's crazy. Have you, have you done anything with that Slack chat? I haven't yet. I feel right. like I should. Um, yeah. But I've got well, like, like get me in it. <laughs> yeah. Just like, hi guys, meet Emilio. <laughs> That's mad. So did you did you have any idea that anybody would put you up for a nomination? No idea. Literally no idea. I woke up one day um, getting ready for work, basically. And then like I just checked through my email and it was just there. And I was like, is this? What? You know you have to check at the top if it says it's from a ma mailing list or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Nothing. Like so I unsubscribe. Just, yeah, I was looking for the unsubscribe button. It wasn't there. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm glad I didn't press it. But no. Yeah, it's mad. It's what did what, what's come off the back of that? Like, what what's that process been like? Like, have you? I can imagine even just you know, for me, that's how I found you. I'm sure other people have found you that way. Like, what's it been since then? I think it's been like crazy in terms of like recognition. Yeah. I think people have all the things that I've sort of done in in football up until this point. You know, mm. for me, have been like huge personal triumphs. Mm. But it's like you know, Forbes is one of those things that you see and it's almost unattainable. Like yeah. People see it and think like, yeah, you have to be the best of the best mm. to kind of come into that category. And then I was just like, should I be here? It's <laughs> imposter bad. syndrome a little no. bit. But yeah, it was, it, I think off the back of that, just yeah, the recognition alone has been has been mm. crazy. So would you say the recognition for that has been even more than everything you've done previously? I don't know. I think it's a different answer to different communities. I feel like right. Forbes is probably maybe one of the more overarching things mm. in terms of like, my sort of like professional career type of yeah. thing but some people might consider you know working with your favorite footballer or playing for your country to be bigger so yeah yeah for me it's still a bit of a toss-up I never really kind of have a definitive answer for that Let, let's take it back to that because reading through your story obviously you've been an inspiration for so many footballers out there and just um people in general tell me about the first time you started to play football like what was that like um I've been playing football since I was like eight I right. think um, it was one of those things that everybody was playing in primary school. Yeah. I don't really think too much of it. I kind of just, yeah. lunchtime, like the bell would go, you'd go outside and everybody would just run to the grass and pick teams yeah. and go from there really. So I didn't see it as sort of kind of stepping away from the norm because everybody around me was doing it. But then what I didn't realise is that everybody around me in question was all the boys. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I sort of kept playing. Um, and then it just, it just became a, a part of me really. What, what was your school like in terms of... Um like pushing you to play football were they supportive so my school was like firstly in a really like super diverse area right um so i grew up in like you know with like a lot of the muslim community around me yeah. somali community pakistanis yeah. indians bengalis like all sorts yeah. um and then so i was playing quite a lot and i think while i was playing in school people kind of mm. took a little bit of time to warm to it mm. and then i remember we had like um like an after school club we went to yeah. and it was like one that other schools could come to and stuff like it was pretty open just like mm. a football session in the area like run by a local club and then I remember my first time that I went obviously I went with like the boys that I play with in school and then somebody made a comment like someone from another school was just like oh, why is there a girl here and before I could even open my mouth the boys were like but she's better than you and then it just Love like that. kicked yeah. off from there so I kind of I didn't really notice that it wasn't like a normal thing until I kind of left the school and mm. yeah the, the boys were basically backing me <laughs> when I was arguing with other, yeah. with other kids but then they got used to it and then it's just a cycle I feel like people are kind of weird the things that they're unfamiliar yeah. with 
So if you started playing when you were eight, when you were eight years old, mm. what have, what have the pathways been like, and how have they changed for women in football since you've been playing? Yeah, I think it's difficult because I feel like there's there's been there there's been a massive gap in terms mm. of going from like the amateur level to the elite. Mm. I think it's a little better now, but mm. when I was like younger, it was literally like if you weren't in an academy from X age, like yeah. nine, ten, whatever it is, yeah. and even nine, ten is probably a bit late. Mm. Um, you have no chance. Nine, ten is eight. Nine, ten is a bit late. Yeah. Nine no, no, literally a bit like really? if you're not starting from like sort of six, seven years old, really? getting into an academy and then kind of working your way up the ranks and proving yourself at every stage because like you know, you hear stories of like, kids getting released all the time. Um, it's impossible That's without a lot of pressure that. for a young kid. It is. And I think that the added thing is that a lot of these sort of academies were based so f- like far away, like either mm. sort of outskirts of London or mm. like just really, really far and really sort of difficult to get to. And like for me, for example, like if my, my mom's a single mom and it's mm. like I'm the youngest of seven. Right. How can she then take me to, I don't yeah. know, Academy in like Millwall, for example, yeah. when we live in West London and, you know, there's six other kids around. So, yeah, yeah I think so what, what was difficult. your journey like then? Like what was the pathway for you? For me personally, I never sort of like had, I guess, that access to that sort of Academy level. I'll be mm. real. I started, I joined my first club at 14 because I think that was the first age that I could. Right go by myself do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so it was a club that wasn't too far from the local area but it was like I was at an age where I could sort of go with my friends yeah. it's not too far from home go to training yeah. come back home um and it was cool I think that was an interesting one because obviously like and uh, you know I've said this story before but like navigating the like the differences between myself and like my fellow players mm. like I was having a conversation with like the manager after I got selected mm. we were talking about kit and he was like oh so you know what what size shorts do you wear and I was just like oh, right well Okay, yeah. um, and then I obviously had to have that conversation, you know, like obviously I'm from a Muslim background, I'm not comfortable wearing shorts, do we have an alternative? Mm. Um, and I remember him saying something, you know, along the lines of, you know, I, I wouldn't know because I've never had a Muslim player on my mm. team before. And then it's like, it kind of almost dawned on me a little bit. I was still quite young, but it's like, mm. that was the first time I really sort of felt like the other a little bit right, in terms okay. of the football in space. Um, so yeah, joined my first club at 14, played sort of recreational until I was about, yeah, 16. Then I went off to... I was at Brentford for a little bit. Like I just, I sort of went around the area really, mm. um, went off to uni and then, no, tracked back a little bit. Yeah. 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 So yeah. till 16 and then yeah. at 16, I had trials to kind of go to play in the States, mm-hmm. um, looking at sort of going out there because obviously women's football was massive in yeah, America yeah. at the time, much yeah. bigger than it, than it was here. Yeah. And I sort of looked at that option and yeah, like I passed the trial stage and everything. I was, I was mm. set to go, but I think this was not long, <laughs> not long after Trump got elected. So my mom was just like, that's nah, not happening. Not happening. <laughs> and I understood why. Yeah. But obviously, you know, not at the time I was probably, you know, moody little kid about it. But, you know, at the time. Yeah. Where in the state? So it was, so I got into like sort of the agency. I was looking at going sort of like to Florida side, yeah, yeah. maybe. But I still had quite a lot of options in terms of where I wanted to go. Mm. But yeah, it, the whole country was yeah. written off, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. But I think it was a blessing in disguise because yeah. I wouldn't have got here otherwise. Go, tra- back, like, backtracking to Sorry, yeah, um, the the first club you, that you started playing for and mm-hmm. the fact that that was the first time that as you said you felt like of the other mm-hmm. and you didn't have alternatives mm-hmm. did like were they quite open to finding you alternatives and like did they work with you with that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah. think i've i've been super lucky in the sense that like the managers that i, that I had mm-hmm. at the time were mm-hmm. super supportive right. i don't i don't think other teams had the same kind of openness yeah towards me on the pitch yeah. but yeah, like they were really good at sort of setting me up with something different, always yeah. making sure we were comfortable and, yeah. you know, like in, we're playing like Ramadan and stuff like that, making sure that, yeah. you know, we're, we're good to train and things like that. So Amazing. Yeah. Um, And then, so then, sorry, going back forward again. So then <laughs> right. you're at Brentford and then what's like the next step then after that stage? So that's the point that I decided I, I wanted to look at going to the States. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I looked at, I went I went on trial. So, like, the way that it kind of works is you kind of go to, like, an Got agency. You. Yeah, yeah. So, you, yeah. yeah, you trial yeah. for the agency, then you go through, like, the interview process, all yeah. of that, and then they basically say, listen, we can get you X amount of offers, mm-hmm. you know, in these places. Yeah. What, what are you sort of saying, really? Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, yeah, I had sat down, had that conversation with my mom and my family, and then we just decided that it wasn't, it wasn't the best thing for me to do, like, mm. as a young black Muslim woman, yeah. without much family in the States, because mm. the majority of my family is in Canada at the time, like my mum's siblings uh, and stuff. Okay. Um, we used to live there for a little bit. Really? Yeah, I lived in Canada when I was like seven, 
Ish, was Canada seven. an option for you to go play? Do they have a football like what's? Football I looked like at it, there? but it wasn't as big as the states. Yeah. It probably was equivalent to what was going on here. Okay, so I, it wouldn't have been much of a change for me to go out there. I think. Yeah. So yeah, without much family in the states, mom kind of just decided that it wasn't the yeah. best move. You, I've, I've obviously read a lot about your story and the the awareness that you've kind of focused on it in terms of being a female Muslim playing football, wearing a hijab. And the times that you've been told that you're not allowed to to wear a hijab, what was that like? And now that you're older, how did that make you feel back then? I am I'm still as appalled by it as I was at the time. Yeah. I think I, I was really like just you know, and as a kid, I feel like there's there's a difference in terms of when when someone in a place of authority is giving you an instruction because mm. I feel like you you feel like there's no other option and the world is crashing down in a way and it's super super dramatic. But yeah. At the time, I remember just thinking, like, this, like, why would there be any reason for me to not be able to, yeah. you know, play like this? I think they tried to say something like, oh, it was a health and safety hazard. I was wearing glasses at the same time. <laughs> you didn't say anything about my yeah. glasses, but I have to take my head. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, it was crazy. But, yeah, I think I think it's mad. I think that we're in a much better place now. Right. And referees and coaches and fans and a lot of people are a lot mm -hmm. more educated, mm -hmm. hopefully, in, in most cases anyway. Um so that kind of thing doesn't happen as much, but it's, I think it's crazy that I had to even go through that at that age yeah. and that anyone else does even. And, and you've ra raised so much awareness and you've become a role mo model for so many young, you know, female footballers. How does it feel when some when somebody calls you a role model? Like, are you comfortable with it? I don't know because <laughs> I didn't I didn't set out to be one. Yeah. I think I didn't I didn't kind of go out to be this person that people kind of. I guess look up to and I said it wasn't like an an active sort of thing I didn't really want to yeah. be this person that people kind of put on a pedestal because I feel like yeah. there's a certain level of pressure that comes with it mm. and you know everyone's human and everyone kind of makes mistakes and things like that but yeah I do so, like feel an, an immense sense of pride yeah because like I sometimes I look at the things that I've done I try and kind of look at it from a third person perspective like that isn't me like I'm just like I didn't know that I did that. I'm just like reading it body yeah <laughs> literally I try and look at it like that and then I just think, like, imagine if I was, you know, 13, 14 and I saw this, like, how how would that have made me feel at that time? And yeah. it, it makes it all worthwhile, really. It makes it all worth it. Yeah. What's it like? I'm, I'm assuming you get, like, our agency works a lot in social media with creators and whatnot, and they get a lot of people messaging them and asking them questions about things. Mm -hmm. What's that like when you're when you're actually getting messages from people that are looking up to you? Yeah, I think it's a blessing, yeah. definitely. And I think that... I always try and do everything that I can to use the connections that I've built and the people that I've met along the way to, mm -hmm. yeah, like put people on. Because I feel like if I, firstly, I wish I would have had somebody that, you know, yep. could have done that for me to the same extent that I'm yeah. trying to do it for people. Um, and secondly, if I'm not going to do it, who else is? Mm -hmm. like, like, what is the point of me, you know, being in the position that I am and having met all these people if mm -hmm. I can't then, you know, assist the little ikras that, you know, need that yeah. kind of assistance? Yeah. So yeah. it's a blessing, really. How important has social media been for you? massive yeah so yeah social media is is has been massive for me um particularly obviously i'm from a somali background so mm. yeah the somali community on on social media has yeah. literally been my sort of my rock really and truly like they're yeah. really really supportive of me and everything that i do and yeah i, I genuinely I, like i wouldn't be anywhere near I, where i am if it wasn't for all the people that kind of support me from yeah. here there and everywhere it's not even just people sort of in the uk and london like i've got people obviously back home Mm. that like I remember oh my god funny story <laughs> <laughs> basically I was at um where was that I was in I was in Dubai I think for for um like a, a shoot that I was doing a campaign yeah. and then there was like a, a photo that of like a campaign I did ages ago with like Chelsea from the kit launch like I think two years ago yeah and it was obviously me like trademarked football on my head <laughs> to have an insert picture here <laughs> <laughs> a trademark sort of thing of that and then um there was like a tournament somebody messaged me it was like hey there's this tournament that we have yeah. Can you guys make it? Like, can you make it down? This is that, and like, I couldn't at the time because just because of the scheduling. Um, and then they sent me a picture on the day, and they had like a massive poster of me, like, <laughs> like a massive, literally thing of me with a ball on my head like that, and it was like zip tied to the, to the fence <laughs> while they were playing the tournament. It's gotta be so surreal, isn't it's it? It's crazy, like it's so crazy because I, like I still feel yeah. like I'm just me. Do you know what I mean? I feel like I haven't yeah. changed much in terms of who I am. I try to kind of remain like, humble or whatever yeah. you sort of label it as, but. Yeah, it's really surreal when kind of people hold you to such a high regard. Mm. Um, 
and have posters of your face <laughs> at their football tournament, which is mad. Yeah, because I imagine when you grew up, you had posters of your favourite footballers, yeah. and now you're on that on that yeah. poster. You were talking about your Somali background, and you've captained the national team, right? Yeah. What yeah. is that like? Mad. Pressure, like, but... yeah, I think. So it's been, yeah, the, the Somali Football Federation is a little bit here, there and everywhere at the minute. Yeah. I think they're going through like a real sort of restructure. Mm. Um, there was like somebody that was running it for like 20 years mm. and now they've got a new president. Right, so okay. it's like a huge sort of turnover situation. But before anyway, with the old president, we had like mm. a, a game that wasn't sort of officially recognised. It was a bit all over the place. But yeah, we played in Cape Town, South Africa. Mm. And there's like a quite a significant Somali community in right, South Africa. Okay. So like, we played the game and we got there. And we're playing against a team from Zimbabwe. And then, like, we had, like, fans in the stands. They had, like, flags out, everything. And then, obviously, we lost the game, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but after That's the game... Important. Yeah, it's not important. It's fine. After the game, they all sort of came onto the pitch. And we're like, yeah, captain, can you know, can you sign my shirt? Can I get a picture? No captain. I'm like, so, like, me? <laughs> is, is it me that you're talking about? Like, yeah. it's so... Makes so all surreal. the training and the hard Everything, work and the yeah. late nights like super, super worth it. Yeah. How, how have you balanced like, just going back to the social media thing, like, mm -hmm. how have you balanced like being a personality, if mm -hmm. you will, and your football like over the years? Like, because I know from managing just content creators that are mm -hmm. doing it full time, it is a full time job sometimes, like mm -hmm. staying on top of it. And like, how have you balanced those two things? I think with me, it's been sort of trying to keep my social media sort of like as, as authentic as possible yeah. so it almost doesn't feel like i'm working mm. <laughs> so if that isn't sort of a weird way to put it but um yeah just try to keep it authentic on this side and just manage my priorities and just make sure that at the end mm. of the day sort of i'm happy with what i'm doing and what i'm putting out and mm. everything is good with number one how do you with, in terms of like keeping authentic to yourself how do you deal with the pressures of maybe whether it's brands wanting to work with you or campaigns that are trying to be pushed towards you or even like what friends and family are saying that you should be promoting like mm. how do you keep true to yourself when you're when you're sharing your story online um i am really hard-headed <laughs> 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 i'm so stubborn um yeah. that's probably what got me to this point because yeah. realistically if yeah. i wasn't then all these people that told me that football wasn't for me yeah probably would have put me off by this point but um yeah, yeah hard-headed crew so i kind of just yeah. i kind of block things out and i think my, my friends and family have been super super supportive like i've got re like a really good support system mm. like my husband my friends everybody's yeah. sort of really in tune with sort of how i work now mm. um and most people know that i will come to you if i need advice yeah. a lot of the time yeah um and i'll take in what you need to say but yeah, I think we have a good sort of dynamic in terms of like my friends knowing that, she, you know, she knows what she's doing yeah. and sort of leave her to it a little bit. Um, and with social media, I feel like you can't please everybody anyway. So yeah. I try and maintain the morals that I have and like the things that I've always said that I was about and mm. that I've raised to sort of hold in high regard. Mm. Um, and everything else just vibes. Well, um, <sighs> social media is a funny one for me because obviously I love social media because I've got a company that's a social media based love and I can't, yeah. can't, not, can't not love it. But there is a, a dark side social media yeah so with growing a profile you're always going to get hate like you said you can't please everybody mm. how have you dealt have you had much hate have you dealt how have you dealt with it yeah um yeah i think i think there's yeah. always that darker side like you said that comes yeah. with it and you just kind of have to I mean, ignore it as too sort of mm. blunt really but you, mm. you do have to look past it and just think you know there's a bigger picture here like yeah. this person has too much time on their hands <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah. and just yeah look at the bigger picture look at all the you know all the positive messages rather than mm. rather than the negative and yeah. you know it, it will sit in the back of your mind sometimes but yeah mm. you've got to do your best to push it out and just get on with it really does that sometimes motivate you to keep spreading your message yeah keep 100%. raising awareness yeah yeah i love a hater <laughs> i love a hater yeah. <laughs> obviously like i think yeah it, it is motivation but it's also just like yeah you you're you're mad because you know i got to this point so i need to get further so you can give me more, more mad basically yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that's that's the vibe that hard-headedness is quite a funny concept because i think it's more being like resilient really yeah you know um have you always been resilient since a kid? Like, have you? Uh, where's that resilience come from? Um, my mom. Right. My mom is the most resilient, hardworking, intelligent woman that yeah. I know. Um, you know, she's like she moved to the country not knowing the language, not knowing the yeah. the system or anything like that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And she went out 
you know, like learn English firstly, yeah. which is mad because the way that this language is set up, sometimes I think if I had to relearn <laughs> it as an adult, I'd be finished. I can barely speak. Yeah, it I can barely speak it. Yeah. Now I've lived it my whole life. Um, so yeah, like she went out, learned the language, learned the system, made yeah. sure you know we were always in school, made sure she always sort of you know attended our meetings, insisted that she didn't want to translate us, she was going to sit there and you know speak to them herself and yeah. just yeah, always sort of was the one that was supporting me and and you know mm. stood behind my back, had a hand on my shoulder. So. Yeah. Yeah, my mom, my mom is definitely my motivation when it comes to just powering through life and getting things done. And I guess sport as well has been a huge anchor for you in terms of being resilient mm -hmm. and what that teaches you because nobody becomes a professional athlete in any sport without being resilient, right? Yeah, 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 100%. I think there's there's so many knockbacks and things like that. Like, even till now, like, it, it never really stops. Two years ago, like, I had a, you know, ankle injury. I was in a, I was in a boot. And funnily enough, I was meant to... So this is, like, my second... Most people don't know about this though, but this is like my second um, go at playing in the States. Right. So I had a good friend basically that, you know, was knew somebody at a college in America and was like, listen, we can get you, you know, set up to go out there, this and that. Um, mm. And this is when I was sort of just coming to the end of my degree. So right. I thought, okay, cool, I can go out there, do my master's, mm. you know, play in the States for two years. It's yeah. a new experience. Um, and then, yeah, as I was sort of trying to get my tapes together and send things off, I, yeah, I tore a ligament in my ankle, <laughs> which was mad, but. It, you know, it was a sign, I think, for me at the time. Like, it was one of those things where, like, I prayed on it and I was just like, yeah, like, if there's, you know, if this is the right journey for me and I'm really meant to go mm. and, you know, ex explore the States and go that pathway, give, like, give me a sign almost. And mm. then a couple of days later, I told my, <laughs> told my ligament. So I was like, all right, cool. This is not what I was looking for, but it's fine. No, so, that's a good um, way to think about it. Are you, do you think it's something you'll explore in the future, going over there? I, I think that door's probably closed for me now. Right. Yeah, I would say so. But in the best of ways, like, yeah. I think, yeah, I'm not really mad at it. Around that same time that I had my ankles when I met my husband as well. Well, my husband now. But right. at the time, I was also just like, oh, I just met this guy, not sure, kind of want to leave the country. And then, so yeah. I feel like everything kind of went the path that it was meant to. Um, yeah. And this is twice now, it's been a nurse. I probably won't, <laughs> probably won't go that way again. Don't want to hurt my ankle. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, is, there, is there anywhere else the way you'd want to play? Um, I think with me, like, I'm not I'm not old, but in a football footballing sense, I'm a bit old. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm kind of coming that is towards. Scary, isn't it? It's yeah. funny because when I'm when I'm watching just any matches or anything, they're like, "This is 16 year old," and I'm like, L "It's mad." Honestly, I feel so old. And then they say, <laughs> "Oh, so and so is coming to the end of their career," and I'm like, "They're my age." Yeah, like, what is going on? Literally, it's so, so it's crazy. But like, I think with me, like my footballing career, like having now started a club, like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm more or less bound to Hilltop. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. So yeah. we're, we're Hilltop. So for anyone that doesn't know, like yeah. talk about your role there a little bit. Okay. So a bit of a funny one. So when I was 19, I yeah. started a football club. Yeah. Um, It was originally called NOR, which actually stood for Never Underestimate Resilience. So it's funny that you mentioned resilience. Yes. Yeah. So it was called NOR, uh, Women's Football Club. And then obviously COVID and everything happened. So yeah. we basically merged with another local club that was like helping us out quite a lot anyway. Right. Um, And that was Hilltop. So we came under so they have they have a men's team uh, and a youth team so we just joined yeah. and then obviously created sort of one big happy family um yeah. like i had players on my team that had you know siblings and a men's team anyway right. so it all just made sense we trained in the same area mm. um so yeah the club is now obviously called hilltop um mm. and our team is obviously hilltop women yeah. and yeah so my role in the club sort of changed from like founder to more like sort of like director of women's football so i still run the women's team it's just now under a sort of larger umbrella yeah. um and yeah so i i run the team and i play but i don't like actively coach anymore because i feel like i couldn't wear all the hats um yeah that's a lot also like that player that player manager role is a very blurry one like, how do you choose when you play or you don't play? yeah you, just, you forget this get your kit on yeah, like. yeah exactly <laughs> like, oh, they're not doing their job yeah let me just come on yeah i think yeah it, it was a difficult one to kind of juggle, the juggle a little bit yeah so i i thought you know the, like to to run something well you have to mm. know when to take a step back yeah um so we sort of reshuffled that and obviously we had like managers and coaches come in to yeah. do that stuff and what's I think the response well. been like since since you've been like because now you've, how many years have you been there now four yeah so i've started the club 2019 four years now wow so how, what's what's the response and how has it changed over the years i think it's it's been it's been massive like in terms of the response like yeah. like from people in general at like the public yeah they've really sort of bought into the idea of like the family club do you know yeah. what i mean because yeah, yeah. before obviously we, like we were a women's team and they were a men's side and it was you know perfect in and, yeah. of, in and of itself but yeah. coming together like just generally having that wholesome sort of umbrella especially because the majority of the club like the club is sort of mm. Somali run is yeah. the kind of premise really yeah. um so obviously like Hilltop is in terms of the men's team is the most successful um Somali run team in the 
world, I'm going to oh, say. Because wow. obviously they play step five football. The majority of the other teams are mm. sort of like amateur, just coming into semi-professional. Right, okay. So our men's team is semi-pro. And yeah, yeah they, they've been around since 2005. So it's, it's, it's been a long time sort yeah. of coming to get to that stage. Um, So even just to buy into that success, obviously, was a huge yeah. plus from our, from our end. So we've got a lot of people that, you know, genuinely support the club, have love yeah. for it. Um, And then players... Like there's a there's a great culture within the like within the club in terms of supporting other teams. Like mm. we'll go to the men's games, they'll come to ours. Mm. We'll go to the you know the academy games and things like that. So it's good. It's yeah. we're having a good time good over here. Good yeah. Vibes. What's what's the how has women's football changed since the Euros? Hmm. How has women's football changed since the Euros? Um, it feels a bit more normal. I think people don't... What do you mean by normal? People don't look at you twice as much right. walking down the street with a football under your arm. Love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like you could sort of just... Like, for example, like we'll go down the local power league and there'll be a picture of us sort of, you know, just playing like some of the girls. Obviously, we're, the season's finished now, so we're mm. just having a bit of a kickabout. Mm. Um, and yeah, we'll have a little five-a-side game here and then you've got you know, a bunch of uncles on the pitch next to us, mm. pub lads on the one next to that. Like, it's all, it's all sort of mixed up and then it's yeah. just like people don't almost bat an eyelid anymore because it yeah. just feels a bit... Yeah, it feels a bit normal, and I've I've never I never thought I'd genuinely enjoy like people just not care like just yeah. not caring about us even being there at all type of thing because yeah. it's in the best of ways like it just feels like it's it's not an anomaly anymore. For for me, it, it raised such an awareness of of women's football. Mm, yeah. Um, and even now, even if, like I'm addicted to like Sky Sports and BT Sports and just seeing it in what I call like Premier slots. Mm. It's like the the Premier League, it's 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 always there, and mm. I feel like that has changed since the Euros. Yeah, it's almost like the, and this, I want to talk about this a little bit as well. Like the the TV networks are now themselves buying into it mm. a bit more. Like mm. I don't know if you've seen the same. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's it's definitely a lot easier to watch a WSL game yeah. than it was, you know, even last year or a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, obviously I'm a Chelsea fan so I'm having a great time <laughs> women's <laughs> yeah. wise maybe not so much the men's no but, we won't talk about yeah, the we won't. but um, yeah no, it's, it's been a massive change even even like, in terms of broadcasting like you said yeah it's um, yeah that, talk to me about that a little bit because I, for, for so long it was impossible to see a women's football game mm. on TV mm. and there's obviously huge disparities in terms of um, the gender pay gap in the sport mm. And one of the main arguments was always, well, they don't have the TV deals that the men do. They don't have the attendance that the men do. Mm. But then the counter argument is, well, you never put it on TV. Mm. So what's that been like for you over the years, like not being able to just turn on the TV and watch a, you know, yeah. a, a women's football game? Yeah, I think it's difficult. And it's just like a lot of the times that people kind of, you know, want to make the argument of, you know, the quality of the women's game, for yeah. example, they'll bring up some random video that they, they've seen on TikTok or yeah. YouTube and they'll pull it out in the worst yeah. bit of context. But it's just like, you don't, if you don't sit there regularly enough and, you know, watch it week in, week out, how can you, you know, gauge no, the yeah. sort of, exactly. like, yeah, like what's going on there, essentially. Um, so it's been difficult. And I think now, like, it's just, yeah, like I, I was in, I can't remember where I was, I walked into like a, like a cafe or something. Mm. And like, I looked up and it was just women's football. And I was just like, this is mad. Yeah. <laughs> this is so crazy. But it, like in the best of ways, like, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. And I think that it's, it's going to do so much for the younger mm. generation, like just for them to be able to see it. See it. Because you have a role model. Yeah, because we yeah. didn't like, e even the role models that we did have, we couldn't, we didn't see them often. No. Like we had like maybe the Rachel Yankees and the mm. Martyrs and the Christian. Like it's just, we didn't, we mm. didn't have that regular access to them. So imagine now being able to watch Sam Kerr on TV every yeah. weekend. Like it's crazy. So no, I love it. I love it. For or them. even people like Jill Scott who went on um, I'm a Celeb, like yeah. having it, having a having those role models that are not just on the pitch but mm. then also off the pitch so yeah. that they can see like what kind of pathway you've got as a career yeah is is so powerful because um yeah for the longest time it was just like just u.s football players that mm. was it that's yeah. all you'd know like is it alex, alex? alex morgan yeah, yeah alex morgan and that lot so yeah. i think it's been amazing i think that um what from your opinion though is still needs to be done in the women's game and I'm sure that's a big question and I know there's probably a lot that needs to be done but yeah. like what are the next kind of steps that are needing to be done that are missing right now I think for me like I think there's there's so many different ways to look at it right because yeah. obviously the way that like my, like me as an individual is set up like my personality or like there's there's an intersectionality to my identity right 
So obviously as a woman, I'm having a great time. Women's football's on TV. I'm, I'm yeah. you know, I'm seeing sort of more of that and it's amazing. But, yeah. you know, as a black woman or as a Muslim woman, yeah. it's not that same sort of sense of pride because okay, yeah. I'm not seeing as, as many people on that screen that look like me, mm. right? Like looking at the area that I grew up in or mm. just walking around London sometimes. Um, and even like, being you know in the women's game at a slightly lower level just looking yeah. around like the grassroots game there's so much diversity mm. and i just don't understand why it doesn't translate into the elite like mm. game or even into the england squad you know like if you just look at the squad that they had at, at, at the euros like amazing that they won i love it for us yeah. but it's like that that sense of diversity yeah. isn't reflective of what the country is now and is that the pathways do you reckon or is it investment yeah, in I grassroots think, yeah i think i think it's, it's all of the above i feel like it yeah. isn't it, it is not as easy for, you know, inner city black girl or, or a young Muslim woman mm. to to try and get into the England squad or to try and find mm. a path into, in, into the England squad. And that is because of one, connections. I feel mm. like, you know, it, it is more difficult if you don't have the right network. Mm. Um, and especially if, you're, you know, people in the working class might not have the same network as somebody that's, you know, middle or upper class that yeah. might know somebody from down the road that used to coach in the England under 50s or something like that, yeah, yeah. which is crazy. So... Yeah, networks and also just yeah, accessibility. The resources, know? like you were saying yeah. earlier, to get to training. If you're yeah. at an academy, you can't, you know, if you don't have the yeah. resources to be able to get there, mm. and maybe that's one of the reasons as well. 100%. But I know that there's there's steps being taken in that direction. I know mm. the FA are sort of looking at... What kind of steps are they taking? I think the FA are looking at like sort of like a referral sort of program almost right, where okay. you can, you know, if you run a grassroots club or um, a national league club or something like mm. that, you can sort of look at referring players. Mm. directly to like sort of England trials rather than them having to go through a regional talent center I think they changed the name now but yeah yeah going through RTC or things like that so there's I know there are steps being taken to kind mm. of create other pathways but I don't think it'll ever be as easy as not as easy but as sort of mm. diverse as, as the men's team in terms of the way they're doing it I think the biggest thing is also like with the men's side you've got the grassroots game and then you've got semi professional, like that sort of non league section. Mm. And then you've got the pro game. Mm. We are missing that middle bit. Right, it very right. much goes grassroots, grassroots, grassroots. Pro. Like women, yeah, women's championship, women's super league. Like it's, there needs to be that middle ground. Is, is that maybe like the uptake as well of, of the game? No, because the teams are there. Like right. we have obviously the women's football pyramid. Like there are national league teams and things yeah. like that. And like, you know, you've got loads of like. <laughs> From, like not all the men's side are Premier League clubs mm. but that aren't investing in their women's teams right. like we've got teams that are playing like National League where you know if you look at the men's side that's a full time job do you know what I mean mm. and the women just like you know they may have their expenses paid like <laughs> maybe it's great like National yeah. League teams that sort of don't yeah, yeah provide the sort of resources for their team like there has to be investment in that sort of middle ground mm. for the games to kind of improve it's hard isn't it like any kind of semi-professional sport it's semi. It's called semi-pro for a reason mm. because you're having to work like a, a real it. job yeah. on the side, and if you don't have the investment there to pay them somewhat, mm. play any kind of player in any sport some money to do it semi semi professionally, it's very difficult to give up your time to mm. go training to play at the weekend yeah. to leave your family for you know a day if you've got an away game or whatever mm. it may be. So that investment is is super super crucial, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. And it's just like, you know, for, for teams that you know, for for lower league teams or teams mm. that their men's side isn't you know as big, mm. I understand a little bit more. But if you've got like you know the Brentfords and other clubs like that, yeah, massive investment into the men's side. Mm. Your women's team is playing national league and they're making their own way to match days. Like mm. it it doesn't make any sense to me personally. Yeah. But it's a nice segue into the the success of Chelsea. Because they've obviously invested. Of course, yeah. And they've seen... I was watching something last night, actually, and it was talking about how many titles they've won. Crazy. It's incredible. Yeah. But then you create a monopoly almost mm. because certain teams aren't investing. Of course. Um, but is it just investment that's made Chelsea so good or is there other reasons behind it? Emma Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Hayes Simple. is the reason. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, I think I think yeah, the investment does play into it. I think Chelsea, mm. like the women's side, mm. has been like a powerhouse in mm. football in the women's game for yeah. so long. And I think that it's a little unfair to sort of compare them to other teams that are sort of making their way up almost. Mm. But yeah, the 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 setup and the structure and the way the priorities sort of lie within mm. the club clearly reflect on 
you know the, the performances and, and the titles that they're sort of maintaining so mm. i think it'd be a good way to, to look at it because mm -hmm. i think I, was it D daniel levy daniel levy yeah daniel, the tottenham you, yeah what's his how do you say his levy name? i think yeah don't mm. quote me on not that. sure but yeah the Spurs owner. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I know uh, yeah. Daniel Daniel Levy, I think, or the Spurs owner, yeah. was saying the other day that, you know, something about not wanting to invest as much into the women or something something along those lines. And I was just like, read the room. <laughs> yeah, like it why why even sense. say it? Why like, honestly? Yeah. It just it didn't it didn't make any sense to me. And I think maybe obviously looking he's at he's always been known as a bit of a um yeah he doesn't spend on his men's team in it. He's not gonna spend, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's, not gonna spend say, he's, been, he's always been like a, a hard, hard business guy that's yeah. like very profit um, orientated yeah. so you know it doesn't surprise me if he's saying stuff like that yeah but that's probably why they haven't got any trophies well so. exactly yeah <laughs> exactly i mean so chelsea where did the, have you always been a chelsea fan yeah i've Day been one. a chelsea fan Day one. since i started watching football right. um that's because my brother my brother's a massive chelsea fan yeah so um yeah, and you were growing up in like the Mourinho years then. Yeah, I was having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was having the time of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I think I still remember that 2012 like yeah. Champions League win. Like, it's yeah, yeah. nuts. Like I, I, I've never experienced anything like it. Like the whole run and just like, you know, it's just the magic of football when you're younger. Yeah. Like it's, it, there's that and then there's just also the way that sort of journey happened and, yeah. you know, believing in something that, you know, didn't seem like it was possible and then it was. And, yeah, because yeah. when he took over, like they weren't, doing that well really were they when yeah. they, no no they, won, they hadn't won anything before like for, the, for like the five or ten five ten years prior to Mourinho coming in they hadn't won anything had they yeah i don't think we won anything and then obviously it was a year after the invincibles isn't it that we, yeah that we went on that um won the league only conceded 15 goals a record that still stands which is crazy wow. um that's what blackpool need yeah <laughs> in the last 10 minutes, the last 10 minutes of the game. <laughs> literally um and then i've got in my notes that to make sure that i talk to you about what it was like doing a campaign with Didier Drogba. What was that like? I've never been so starstruck in my life. <laughs> and I'm not a person, like I try to keep yeah. it cool the majority of the time, but like, you know, like Drogba was one of the reasons that, you know, I, like, I fell in love with Chelsea and, mm. and football as a whole, you know, like, mm. like I said, 2012, like Munich, everything. And then like, <laughs> there's a funny story. There's a tournament, basically. There's a tournament that we used to play in. Um, in year five and six in primary school. Right. And it was like, obviously they had the girls section and the boys section. Yeah. Um, and then I remember like it was year five, it was my debut in the tournament, right? So I, I had my favorite like jump, I think it was green. I had my favorite my favorite little hoodie. So the night before I got a pet, like a Sharpie, like a marker, and I put number 11 on the back, <laughs> which is obviously Drogba's number. Yeah. So I like, I put that on the back, boom, put it on, went to the final, we lost, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> it skipped straight past that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I remember obviously like thinking about that on my way to the, to, from the hotel, Mm. to the set and I was just like I used to write this guy's like shirt number on my back and no, and now no. I'm sharing a stage with him and yeah. it, it did feel like sharing one with him because he's like such a lovely person yeah. he always made sure that you know because obviously we were kind of doing the campaign together he always made sure that it was you know an equal playing field mm. um and yeah we kind of had the same sort of perks and if people wanted a picture with me they had to if people, yeah. people want a picture with him they had to get on with me and yeah. all of that and then it was just crazy. And somebody told him that story, by the way. We, we were talking about it on the way, to the, on the way from the hotel. Um, and the representative like from the organisation said, hey, DDA, she's got a story for you. I was like, why would you do that? No, why are you saying Why it? would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> and then she made me tell him and then he gave me a big hug. And it was, yeah, no, it was, I bet he loved it, really. Yeah, like, that's, no. that's literally what he probably grew up wanting. It's yeah. like kids to be pretending to be him, basically. Yeah. yeah. That's probably what you're doing now for a lot of young girls oh, out okay. there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe, yeah. My shot number's five, guys. Just, just in case. case. <laughs> yeah, just, five, just, just in, in case. case you want to put it. <laughs> going going like, like way back, and I'm going off tangent a little bit, but I, I just want to talk about it. So when you were growing up, because mm -hmm. you mentioned it then, you had, the, you had the boys' team and you had the girls' team. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I grew up, we played we played a lot of rugby where I was from, and every so often there'd be a girl in the team. Mm -hmm. But then it got to an age where it was like, no girls. Yeah. Which at the time, like, it was, that was just what the done thing was. Like, mm. you would just split the teams up, kind of like what you're saying. But to me, one of the most obvious things to break down these barriers for especially young kids is to actually create semi-pro, even pro teams that have mixed teams. Mixed. So, like, yeah. I was watching Soccer Aid the other day, mm -hmm. which has mixed teams, mm -hmm. and it was sick. Mm -hmm. Like it was such a good game. Like and the, you know, Usain Bolt's there and he's pulling his hamstring, and yeah. <laughs> like Tom Grennan's like running around like a madman. And, yeah. But it's just great to see like the female players on there as well. Like Jill Scott was playing. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that that would help a bit more representation in the game to actually see 
some actual pros playing against each other regularly? I think I think it's it's, it's a hugely debated one. Yeah. But I think that it may it may almost cause more more harm than good on the women's game. Right. Okay. I think. And I and I say that with a like with a pinch of salt because it can work and I've yeah. seen it work and yeah, you know, yeah. I've been to football sessions where like, the girls are playing with Amanda and it's fine. Yeah. But I think that people are so heavily focused on the comparison between the men's game and the women's game yeah. that you wouldn't want to, you know, further that almost. Yeah. Um just because I feel like yeah, the women's game should be able to sort of succeed in its own right. Yeah. Rather than trying yeah. to keep up with the men's game in that yeah. sense. But I see why you'd like why yeah. you'd say that definitely. Like I can see why you'd want to sort of put them on that mm. sort of same thing. But my thing is like let them let them be separate. Let them be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let them be separate and sort of as they are. Um and it's funny you said that because when we were in school we had um the final tournament that we were playing in, in like year six. Yeah. And it was basically they had like a quiet rule of thumb where it was like, okay, we'll have basically a boys team and then we'll have one girl. <laughs> But it was like an unwritten rule. But they'll have one girl. And I was fuming because I was the second best girl of my year. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just sitting there like every tournament. I'm just not getting selected. Because Are you still in touch with the best girl one. in your year? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I still, I was still quite like family friends and stuff yeah. like that. She's around. But, um, yeah. Did she play football? Still? Nah, she, she stopped playing like in You're high like, school. I'm the best. Now. Yeah, it's me now. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mona. <laughs> but um, she basically, yeah, she was going to that tournament. And I remember it was our final tournament. And I just kicked up the biggest fuss. Like me, I told you I was hard-headed. Mm. Resilient, resilient. Um, so I kicked up the biggest fuss. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, we're, um, you're not going like without me, basically. Mm. So they said, okay, cool. And bear in mind, they were entering an A team and a B team. So you technically have two teams. You could put one girl on each. Do it's you know what I mean? It's weird to say, like, we're maxing out at one. Yeah, it just, it was so weird. So anyway, I made them, um, <laughs> bullied them into putting me in the team. <laughs> um, and they did. And uh, I saved them in the semi final right. with a goal line clearance. There we go. Yeah. Right. That was it. We lost in the final, though. That's fine. Let's go. Well. <laughs> There's a theme here. Yeah, I know. I was going to say. Um, but, yeah. So you talked about we've talked a lot about the the women's game, but obviously, like you said, you're you're super happy with how the women's game's going and the direction it's going in. But for you coming also from a Muslim background, mm -hmm. there's still a massive lack of representation, yeah. and there's still huge issues just throughout football in terms of racism. And you see all the campaigns of the professional game um, trying to, to to combat racism. But talk to me a little bit about the experiences you've had in terms of racism in football and, and, and where you think it's going? I think, yeah, for me personally, obviously, like there's, I went to uni in Portsmouth <laughs> my first year. I was in Portsmouth. And I think, you know, even beyond that, like going on away games with my team and things like that, like I've almost had it all, like the monkey chants and mm. terrorists and this and that and literally everything in between. Um, mm. And it's like with me, I'm kind of I, I try not to be phased by things like that because you know, I'm just I'm here to play a game of football at the end of the day. But mm. I've I've heard everything that can be heard, and it's it's crazy to me to think that you know that's me on like the grassroots level where really and truly there's no like, there's no cameras and there's no yeah. TV. Like you lot can say what you respect like not respect mm. disrespectfully, <laughs> you can say what you want to mm. me, and there's no sort of repercussions for them. But it's mad to think that people will even still do that to the extent of you know in a stadium professional mm. footballers that you know some of them are even playing for your team and yeah it's crazy i think football needs a huge re like re restructure and sort of rejig when it comes to mm. how we deal with racism because a stadium ban a couple thousand pounds fine is not going to cut it no it's really not going to cut what it what would you what would you do in terms of restructure and the, and the types of processes that you would put in I to think, try and combat it i think people should be prosecuted like g genuinely i think if you've identified a person the same way that if i commit a crime in the middle of the street yeah. i should be, i should be prosecuted for that yeah, in the yeah. same way that you know if it happens in a stadium it's, mm. it's still public property it's still mm. something that should be dealt with the same way so i think people should really like like be prosecuted to, to the full extent that they can mm. as a deterrent but also you know because you did something wrong at the yeah. end of the day i think clubs that you know don't deal with things to the extent they should things that's like, a big one for me the clubs yeah. don't seem to be doing a lot yeah because there is a responsibility there i think i think clubs know i think mm. certain clubs know like the what their fans are like and mm. how they sort of behave and things like that and i think if you don't put a massive deterrent on that mm. it's going to continue so i think one of the things could be like in terms of like club sanctions like just playing behind closed door plays door, uh, playing Playing behind closed mm. doors, I think. Yeah. If your fans can't like behave themselves, mm. and if you can't control should, your if fans, if you can't control them, yeah. then then I don't think they should they should be there. No. I think there needs to be something to kind of show people that we're serious. Mm. I think there's bigger fines and bigger sort of um, 
Like I think even like with the whole Ivan Tony situation, mm. right? Mm. Obviously, clearly wrong for you know for what he's done. Obviously, yeah. But how can you have a, a bigger sanction for for betting than mm. you do for racism? Yeah, it does not make sense to me. I also think when you see certain players be racist mm. and they get a slap on the wrist, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's clearly showing fans mm. that there's no repercussion here. Of course, because if yeah. the fan if the players can do it to one another, yeah, then the fans are like, well, if I'm stood in the crowd and there's twenty thousand people around me, mm. I'll say what I want. Yeah. I'm not going to get caught. Literally, because if you can't get caught in a picture of twenty two, how am I going to get caught with yeah. twenty thirty thousand around me? Which is crazy because that level of audacity is what you know causes it to grow and to mm. continue. So I think, yeah, I think, I think you know the governing bodies, the FA, UEFA, FIFA, they need to put their foot down mm. because it's not good enough. Uh, is there enough representation in those kind of bodies though to really deal with it? No, because no. I think if there if there was, then we wouldn't we, be at this yeah. point. I think sometimes the people that are dealing with the issues that we face are, are, are out of touch with the communities that they're going to be working with mm -hmm. or they're going to be supporting, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's a whole other issue of like, you know, diversity in terms of like the highest levels mm. within the game. Yeah. I think what, there was a vote the other day, oh my God, what was it? It was like a vote on something to do with women's football. I think it might have been like the... TV rights for the World Cup or something mm. anyway mm. and it's like they looked at a list of people that were there and it was just all men I was like <laughs> it, <laughs> I was like what yeah, how? it did not make sense but yeah. yeah that's that's a whole issue in and of itself really yeah. truly. But that, but it's, it's a good conversation to have because it, it, it is so important in terms of you can't fix you can never th fix anything unless you have the representation there mm. to have it so then that is a question about how would you get more diversity into those higher higher roles at the moment mm. in those bodies my thing is there's there are always people that are doing the work mm. it's just a, a case of going out to find them mm. essentially there's always people that you know are in positions where they're you know running clubs or running organizations mm. working in the community mm. um and they, they might have been doing that for 10 15 20 years like the people that i've come across mm. that have been doing work in football for so long mm. with like an, like barely an ounce of recognition in, in comparison to what they've been providing for the community. Mm. So I think it's a case of going out to look for them because mm. people like a lot of these roles and things like that that come out and you know these like positions on a board of trustee or whatever it may be. A lot of the time it isn't accessible to the communities that you're trying to bring in. Mm. Um, so I think it's got to be more of sort of like a forward approach and even just training people up. There's nothing wrong with you know mm. finding somebody that you know has a real interest in you know, this role for X role, whatever yeah. it may be. Um, they've got a lot of experience, but maybe they're missing that sort of final touch in terms of like rounding things off and making them the well-rounded candidate. Mm. There's nothing wrong with training that person up and then, no. you know, putting them forward later on to for, for another role or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. What plans have you got for the future? What's What, what are your goals? Oh. Like, you, you seem like somebody that just would always have 30 goals at the same time. <laughs> what, I what... score one goal a season, <laughs> <laughs> I should say. Um, so like what what what's your main focus now for the next few years? Um well, this is probably actually a good time to yeah. Well, okay. You know when you just got loads yeah. of thoughts right here. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um so yeah. In the next few years, I think I've done a lot of work with like adult women, like over the age of sixteen. Mm. Um, so obviously at Hilltop, like we've got our women's team that is, mm. you know, adults, but generally sort of outside of that, as much as you know what I do and like my presence on social media and things like that is mm -hmm. inspiring inspiring a younger generation yeah. i want to work with them more more actively and more directly mm. so this summer we're going to be launching a few camps um nice. across the country hopefully one in london obviously um yeah. birmingham and possibly cardiff um and basically yeah, doing a camp for girls between the age of 11 to 16 mm. from um especially from the muslim community but yeah. obviously it's open to all but yeah. we'll do a sort of camps to I guess give them a space to come together and just like play football. Yeah. Um, the coaches that I have there will be from similar backgrounds to them. It will be hopefully be other, you know, young yeah. Muslim women. So yeah, I guess kind of just uniting the community and just showing them that you can have a space in football. I love that because from even just this conversation, it's, it seems like that grassroots, so like getting involved with the grassroots and developing the grassroots seems mm. like almost the number one fix for everything get more yeah, people yeah. into the game, get people enjoying it, feeling comfortable playing, and then it will hopefully go from there. Yeah. Because like you said, if you don't get, God, what you said at the beginning, but you, when you get picked up at the age of eight, mm. you need to be working with those age yeah. of 
Yeah, literally. yeah, literally, yeah. And I think it's also just like football as a whole. Like I think people sort of look at football and think, I've, I've either got to be a professional footballer mm. or maybe a football coach mm. or maybe a referee. Like mm. that's maybe all the roles that they can think of. But you'd be surprised how many roles there are in football. Yeah. Like anything that you can do outside of football, you can do within it. If you want to mm. be an accountant, you can be an accountant in football. If you want yeah, to be yeah. a lawyer, you can be a lawyer in football. Yeah, so true. Um, and marketing, to, social media. Literally yeah. anything. I was speaking to a girl the other day who graduated in neurology mm. and she was telling me that she wants to look at getting into sport, but she's not quite sure how. And I was just mm. like, but there's space. There's space yeah. for any, literally anything and everything. So I think for me, like even giving these girls the experience of, you know, playing football and speaking to other, you know, women that look like them, that are from mm. the same background, um, that are involved in football one way or another. And then mm. just, you know, that small experience, that one camp that they did, you know, in the summer of 2023, they could yeah. be looking at it, back at it 10, 15 years from now and saying, oh, that was the reason I got, that I got involved more in football. Yeah. And I just, I need more of that. I need more of those stories, really, in the, yeah. next, in the next couple of years. And that's what I think I'll be working towards. I love that. Cause literally, if, if, if one if one kid now becomes mm. a professional player, an accountant for a football team in the future, that all those camps are worth it. Yeah. Incredible. Literally. Ikra, thanks so much for coming Thank on. You. I appreciate it. The that. last question I've got for all my guests is, what is the one biggest lesson that you've learned during your life, whether it's, you know, through sport or through your personal life that you could give to people to just have a positive mindset? That's a massive question, that. Is that. Big question. What is the one lesson that I've learned through sport that I'd sort of advise people? Okay. Um, I'm a firm believer in like maintaining your morals mm -hmm. and like your faith and things mm -hmm. like that. So obviously, like I've said, I'm from a Muslim background, I'm Somali. And one thing that my mum always taught me is like, as long as you hold on to your faith and your culture mm -hmm. and like the morals that you sort of you know, grew up with and the values that you learn, mm -hmm. there's nothing in life that you can't achieve. Um, so for me, it's just hold on to who you are, be authentic and take up space. Nice, stay true to yourself. Yeah. Love that. Ikra, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, appreciate it.